popcorn tonight, okay? All right. And so thanks to, uh, to Bill and to Dwight and, and Donnell getting the popcorn done. Now, Donnell can't hear me. She's out in the lobby. Donnell did not want us to have popcorn. <laughs> and, and she lobbied hard. But you saw who won, right? And so that, but she has good reason. She's telling me, you know, it is a huge mess. And, uh, and, and she reminded me of every time we go to the movie and I get up and I, I look back where I was sitting. I got more, more popcorn in my seat than what I ate. But I said, well, you know, these, we're all adults. You know, how messy can this be? And, uh, and I probably know how messy it can be. So if y'all don't make too big a mess, we're going to keep having popcorn and uh, feel free to bring it in and, um, and, so, uh, and all the other snacks that are there. And so uh, it's just great. Now we're starting... Obviously, you know, we're going to start at 6.30. Uh, Awana starts at 6.15. That gives uh, all the, the kids with the, and the parents that little transition time uh, to get here. And so, um, and then Awana will be over at 8, all right? And so uh, we'll be done at 7.30, or somewhere around 7.30, close to it, is the goal. And, um, and so that gives the time for a little bit of fellowship and transition to get to kids. And so Awana is off to a great start. So um, all of you, that some of you are new, and you've got your kids in Awana for the first time, and that's awesome. Um, we love Awana. We have done it in the past. Um, and then it's been a few years since we have done Awana, but we anticipate Awana is one of the great, great, uh, really, programs, you might say, or ministries that um, really reaches children with the scripture and disciples them. And so uh, I've got a great story about Awana. I'm not going to tell you the whole story, but I first heard about Awana probably 35 years ago. And I was probably visiting, I think I was probably in a church somewhere and I saw some on the Awana. I didn't know what Awana was. I thought it was an Indian word growing up here in Oklahoma. <laughs> and uh, because everything's an Indian word. But Awana is not an Indian word. Now, some of you know what Awana means, don't you? Some of you don't. All, let me see here, approved workmen are not ashamed. All right? comes from, um, I saw Keith, <laughs> there is a verse in First Timothy, a, a, a workman is not ashamed, approved workman. And so it's really on the basis of just discipling kids and, uh, and scripture memorization. But here's the thing about Awana. It is the only thing, ministry, I've ever seen that people ask for it by name. By name. Do you have a wana? Do you have a wana? So they're not in here right now, but there's a, a brand new young family that's in our Bethany Learning Center. And so it was open house today. And so they start next Tuesday after Labor Day. But um, we were out meeting some of the parents. And Donnell called me to come out and meet this young family. So this young family, um, they're, uh, they have two little kids. The one's an infant, and their son comes to our preschool. He said, we're going to bring our, your kids, our kids to Awana. He said, we went to Awana when we were kids. And, that's, and parents are looking for it because they have uh, that association. And they know how it, the impact it made in their life. So Awana is great. And so... Uh, I'm glad you're in here tonight, but some of the folks aren't in here that usually are, but you know why? Because they're helping with Awana. This is the other thing about Awana. It is volunteer intensive. It takes a lot of volunteers and a lot of work, and that's great. So if any of you all ever want to volunteer for Awana, you're released to go with volunteer. <laughs> you're not released to go eat dinner, okay? You gotta, you gotta stay here, and so, uh, but just pray for Awana. Uh, Taylor got a great vision for it and the energy and she's recruited a great team of volunteers. Allie Duncan is, um, I think, like an assistant or really the director um, in, in that program, and it's awesome. All right? So let me just tell you, I've missed you all. Hope you had a great, great summer, and uh, but I'm anxious to get back, and uh, it's going to be a, just a great fall as we uh, get started, and we're going to jump right into it. Now, somebody asked me, do I need my Bible? Well, the answer to that question is always, you know, just always. It doesn't matter what we're doing, you need your Bible. Even if we're coming up here on a work day to, you know, do something, bring your Bible. You know, yeah, yes, you need, uh, you need your Bible, but they were just thinking, saying, you know, we're going to be talking about the Bible. Do I need my Bible? Yeah, we need your Bible. I'm going to show you some things uh, maybe in your Bible that you uh, have either wondered about or uh, 
didn't even know we were there. And uh, so uh, that would that'd be great. So, yeah, you need your Bible. And if you don't have your Bible, there's one probably in the seat right down in front of you within reach. And you probably have it on your phone, which is a wonderful thing. Uh, I think it's just a wonderful thing. The Bible has never been more accessible to more people ever in the history of the world. That's awesome. But what's so ironic and tragic is fewer people are reading the Bible and know about the Bible than ever before. And that's tragic. And so, uh, and hopefully uh, we can help in that area with Awana and what we're doing here, okay? All right, let's take a moment. We're going to pray together. If I don't know you, I'm Pastor Randy, and I hope to get to know you real quick before uh, you leave uh, this evening. So you're going to look around, and, um, you know, we don't have the tables. I kind of miss that in the fellowship, but hopefully you'll uh, kind of move around to look to see some people uh, that you don't know and to get to know them, all right? So let's pray. Father, we uh, just come this evening uh, thankful for uh, another day uh, that you've given us as a gift. Thank you for a great summer whatever we may have been doing but now as we head back uh, to school and into the fall we're thankful that we can come together and study uh, your word together and Father we do pray um, for uh, the ministry of, uh, that we have to reach kids and for Awana tonight as it kicks off we pray just be a great great season here of just reaching kids for Christ and, and instilling them the love for the scripture and then be with our students as they meet tonight. And thank you for Pastor Taylor and Pastor Quinn and all the volunteers that serve there. And thank you that we have time to, to come here and to, to study your word together. pray you'll just bless our time together. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, you know, I'm a little bit out of practice, so I forgot to tell you the jokes. I'm going to start with my jokes. So, uh, you know, I've had all summer. I've had all summer. And so I've been trying to stockpile some of these good ones up. And um, it's not as easy as you'd think it would. It sounds. So um, here's just one I had to find at last minute. <laughs> so, um, you know, y'all might not know this, but there's a difference in Baptists and Presbyterians. I don't know if you knew that or not, but there is. Here's just one difference. So a Baptist minister was summoned to the bedside of a Presbyterian woman who was quite ill. As he went up to, up to the sidewalk and he's walking up to the house, he was met at the front door by the little daughter of the woman who said to her, said to, uh, uh, by the daughter of the woman and said to the, the, the Baptist minister, I'm so, and he said to her, I guess, yeah, I'm my way out of practice, all right? <laughs> he said, I'm very glad your mother remembered me in her illness. Is your minister out of town? Oh, no, answered the little girl. He's at home. But we thought it might be something contagious, and we didn't want to expose him to it. <laughs> well, thank you. For that. that's, that's better if I told it better. That's, a, that's pretty good. That's just the difference between Baptists and uh, Presbyterians, all right? So I think you all got your hand out when you came in. All right. And so you've got a hand out. Your pens are available there. See back in front of you. Now, if you, if you did not get an email from me, okay? So I think I sent the email on Monday reminding you. That means you may not be on, my, on the email list. So if this is your first time here or you're just not on our email list, just be sure to leave it, and I'll just put you on our, on our email. Otherwise, you know, if you've got an email from me, I've still got you on there, okay? So you're on there, and you can still sign in. That's great, but that's what that's for. I just want to be sure you're on the list, give you updates every week and, and what we're doing, okay? And so we're going to do a study. You know, uh, someone asked me, you know, when we were winding down last uh, I guess that was just right there at the end of the spring, going into the summer. What would we be, uh, what are you planning on doing uh, in the fall when we come back? And that really, you know, it's kind of a, you know, I, I didn't really know. I was thinking about a couple of things, and, and, um, and they happened to say, you know, I, you know, I really would like to know more about, you know, about where do we get the Bible? Where did the Bible come from? How can we understand the Bible? I want to talk about the Bible. I thought, you know, that's really good. I thought about it all summer. And so that's why I just felt like the Lord would, uh, was just saying, you know, we could take time into a study, a little deeper dive, talking about the story of the Bible, as well as the story in the Bible. Because the story in the Bible, you know, it's a story that really is life-changing for all of us. We'll talk about that. But it's that story in the Bible that you want to be sure is true. You want to be sure it really is the Word of God the story of the Bible 
you know, how can I trust this book? How, why, why should I trust this book? How do I know it's the Word of God? It's important to, to know that. Now, my guess is that, that for many of you in the room, you know, you wouldn't have any question. If I said, you know, do you believe the Bible to be true? Say, oh, yeah, I believe it's true. Do you believe it's the Word of God? Yeah, I believe it's the Word of God. Why do you believe it's the Word of God? Well, I've always believed it's the Word of God. You know, my grandmother believed it was the Word of God. Her mother believed it was the Word of God. My mom believed it was the Word of God. We've always believed it's the Word of God. You know, that, that's awesome. But the, when you go to work and uh, you have a coworker finds out you're a Christian, you may have a Bible there, he finds out you go to church or you see you may be reading your Bible, he says, you really don't believe that book is, is true, do you? So oh, yeah, I believe it's true. Well, why would you believe it's true? Well, what I just told you isn't going to make one difference to him, what your mother, grandmother, anybody thought about it. That person is one, wanting, you know, some more evidence of the fact that, what can, why should I believe this is just not another book among many other books and a lot of just another spiritual writing that we have. And so we'll talk about that too. And so um, what's so great about, okay, we should, I got somebody up in the technical booth who's going to do, take care of that, I know. <laughs> do I? Gerald? <laughs> Gerald? <laughs> okay. See, was that the Lord that was speaking to me up there? The Lord up there? All right. All right. He's on it. You know, we even, we even did, there you go. We, we're, we'll, have, we'll be a little better. We're kind of working this kinks out of this. What's so great about the Bible? And, um, you know, I believe it's the world's greatest book. And, um, and I could give you lots of reasons why I believe that. You could probably tell me why you believe that. There'll be those that, um, that don't believe that. And so we need to be ready to give an answer for why we believe the Bible really is the Word of God. We believe it the, really is the, the most important book that's ever been written. It's the most unique book that's ever been written. It's the most controversial book that's ever been written. And I suppose you could uh, think of other adjectives to describe the Bible. It's a, you could say it's a, it's a complicated book. You could say it's an inspiring book. But without question, you'd have to say it is the most important book that's ever been written, whether or not you believe it or not. I mean, it's just without, with empirical evidence, the Bible is the most significant book that's ever been written and so look at that I can do this the Bible is the world's most loved and loathed book and so many of us in this room all of us in the room I could say you know we we love the Bible we revere the Bible we treasure the Bible you know we love the Bible we also know there are those that just hate the Bible they loathe the Bible they don't, not only do they not believe the Bible, but they don't think anyone should even have the Bible. And it's a book that's banned in, in so many places around the world and not available to, to people. Sometimes uh, I know that I forget and take for granted just how accessible the Bible is and forget about those in the world that don't have that access to the Scripture for whatever reason. And we'll talk about that in a moment but they just don't have it and maybe never even seen one and so it's one of the oldest books in all of the world it's an ancient book it is still the world's best seller so if you check the guinness book of world records this is this is the authority on all these things uh, the world record it's the bible that is the the best-selling book in world history and you know number two it's not even close you know, not even close. And we'll talk about that in a moment, too. It's a, it's a product of the ancient Eastern world, but it's had the greatest influence on the modern Western world. And really, the, the Western civilization is just built on the foundations of, of the truth that we find within the Bible. 
It's been burned by tyrants. It's been revered by believers. It's the most published and translated book, the most quoted book, the most influential book in all of history. Now, that's the Bible, and uh, you have one. My guess is you probably even have more than one. And uh, we should be very, very grateful for that fact. So the Bible, it's been estimated that it is um, that some 7 billion copies of the Bible have been printed uh, since the beginning of printing. And, um, and that's just an estimate. It, it probably is going to be closer to 7 to 8 million Bibles. About 100 million copies of the Bible are sold every year. It's been translated into more languages and, um, and given to more people. Matter of fact, let's see if I can do this. Here we go. Oh, okay. And so I was doing a little research on this. And so this is, a, this is as of September a year ago. So within the last year, this is some statistics from the United Bible Society that we find there. Wycliffe Bible translators have done a little updating on this, but you can see right there that there are 7.2 billion people that have some of the scripture in their language, all right? 7.2 billion. You know how many people are in the world? I think it's getting closer to eight, over 8 billion, uh, but somewhere. So there's still a billion people, close to a billion, that don't have any of the scripture in their language about 5.9 billion Bibles um, are been translated. That's complete Bibles. New Testaments, uh, there's 786 million lang- of people that have that, and at least the New Testament in their language. There are 457 million that have it at least in some portion, a chapter or more, which means there's a total of 7.4 billion language u- that have the, the, the Bible in their language, all right? So how many languages have the scripture? And um, so let me just update a little bit. I'll put it right here. This is, this is Wycliffe. I, so they're very close, but Wycliffe had to lay 3,658 languages have at least some portion of the scripture in their language. Now, that kind of blew me away because, first of all, I didn't know there were 3,658 languages. But you know what? That's only about half the languages. There really are 7,386 languages in the world. So there's a little tidbit. You know, that's, again, that's mind-blowing to me. Um, and these are different you know, tribal languages, dialects. And so you can see there's a lot of different languages in the world. About half of those languages have the Bible. So it's 733, and Wycliffe says 736. It's changing all the time because they're working on Bible translations rapidly. At least have part of the have the whole Bible in their language, 736 in their whole language, 1658. That's increased by about 30 plus. Have the New Testament in their language. Another 1264, according to Wycliffe, have at least a chapter, at least have a chapter, a book, some portion of the Scripture, still leaving over 3,776 plus that still don't have any of the scripture in their native language. You know, it's really hard for me to fathom sometimes because we've known nothing but having the scripture so accessible to us. And this is changing, and there have been missionaries. Now, let me tell you, this is what it's believed is getting ready to happen. The translation of scripture into languages is going to increase exponentially in the next few years. And do you want to know why? I don't hear anybody say, you want to know why? Somebody said it, artificial intelligence. And that's what they even say, it is going to increase. Now, I don't understand artificial intelligence. I'm working with natural ignorance most of the time. (laughs) I worked on that for a long time, that line right there. And... uh, and I'm scared of it a lot. You know, I just, you know, I mean, there's, there's a lot to be frightened of. But like most things in advancements, there are things that can be good. And if artificial intelligence can get the word of God into somebody's language that didn't have it sooner, I thank God for that. 
And so that's a good thing that can happen. Now, there's a lot of bad things I know are happening or are going to happen. May God use that. And um, that's just increasing all the time. And because uh, we'll tell you the story of the Bible, and there have been, you know, so we're, I, think, I think we're getting close to the end of time. For This is just one of those clues, is the, is the Bible's proliferated, and more and more people have it in their language as that happens there. So, you know, but at the same time, the Bible is the scrutinized attack more than any other book in the Bible, uh, any other book in the world. It's been outlawed, confiscated. It's been burned at different times and places in history. It's been smuggled into every place you can imagine, to jail cells and, and to prisons and to the communist countries and, and where people can have it. And, and it, it, John Huss, we'll mention him down the, in several weeks, He's just one of many who were burned at the stake for teaching the Bible as the final authority for the church and, and over the earth, earthly church leaders. William Tyndale, and uh, this is another person we'll be familiar with, he was strangled and burned at the stake. You know why? Translating the Bible into English cost him his life. And, uh, and so these are, you know, if you've never heard this story, we want to tell you that story and, and many more like him. Every week, millions and millions of Christians gather all over the world to listen and to study and to discuss the very words of the Bible. What we believe about uh, the Bible can be the most important central issues in all of our lives and threading its way into the very fabric of who we are and how we live each, every day depends on that. And so when you ask the question, well, where did this Bible come from? Where did it come from? Now, I don't know this. I didn't ask anybody. But to, my guess is there's a, a good number of, of Bible-believing, church-going uh, Christians that probably have the best idea that somehow it just kind of dropped out of heaven and we got it. Well, let me tell you, it, it did sort of drop out of heaven, but not like this, all right? And so it just didn't drop down out of heaven like that. It did come from heaven. But the story of how God did that and how it ended up in your hands tonight, that's nothing short of a, of a supernatural miracle that should boost the confidence and understanding what's going on there. And so why, why do we believe that it's supernatural in its origin? We'll talk about that. And, and who defined what books are in your Bible? So how many books are in your Bible? 66. 66. All right. How many Old Testament? 39. How many New Testament? Oh, there you go. You, you're pretty sharp. You have some Catholic friends, don't you? <laughs> have you ever asked them about their Bible? I bet if you ask them how many books they have in their Bible, they're going to tell you a different number. To tell you the truth, I don't know what that number is right off the top of my head, but it's going to be a few more books. And mostly in the Old Testament. But then there's then the other groups going to talk about, you know, these Gospels you have. You only have four Gospels. We have the Gospel of Thomas in our Bible. And so who decided there would be 66 books in your Bible? Okay. And I'll tell you what that's called, too, in the next few weeks here. All these things are important. But most importantly, you know, this is, this is God's Word. And we're staking our lives and eternity on it. It's a pretty big gamble. I mean, it's a pretty big stake. So, you, you know, we, we should be able to answer the question why we believe what we believe about God, about Jesus Christ, and how we know that, and what we believe about the Word of God that tells us about Jesus and God. What do we believe about the author of the Bible, and are we able to really give an explanation or defense to someone like that ask and so we need to be able to defend that so I do believe that dark times are on the horizon and increasingly important in these times that we struggle to know exactly where our faith is rooted in why and so here's some questions that you may have thought of and that are probably at some course or wonder about you know how do I know that the Bible is the word of God and what does it even mean when I say the Bible is the word of God and what does that mean how do I know the Bible is true? Aren't there some contradiction, contradictions in the Bible? Aren't there some things that maybe aren't true? Do I have to believe every bit about the Bible? You know, how did we even get the Bible here? And 
which version of the Bible is the best? And um, these are all questions we ask around the, the whole big umbrella. Can I really trust the Bible? Can I really trust it? And why? And why can I trust it? So that's what we're going to talk about. First of all, the good Holy Spirit, so, you know, so you'll be informed that you'll, be, you'll know that. It'll probably strengthen your faith that, no, this is really why I believe what I believe about the Bible and why it's God's Word and why I can believe it's God's Word. And so it's to, to be inspired, to be informed. Um, and secondly, it's to be able to give an explanation, to give some answer to someone that wants to know why you think this Bible is such an important book and, and, and why would you even believe that and to be able to answer some of the objections that people have because they're going to, people will come with you almost in a, you know, very antagonistic and, and very critical and say, you know, how can you as an intelligent person believe that that book is true? Oh, it may have some general principles and some good teachings in it, but so does, so does the Koran and so does all these other spiritual books. What makes the Bible? And so we're just going to talk a little bit about that, all right? And so here we go. Got your outline there. I'm going to see if I can keep up with you. And so hopefully you'll have a greater assurance and confidence that the Bible you hold in your hand really is the Word of God, that the Word that God intended for you to have, okay? So we'll just start basics, 101. Go to school. Why is it called the Holy Bible? And so my guess is your Bible's like my Bible. You know, it may, it may have a lot of different things. It's got a different binding. It may have a different translation. But somewhere along the way, it's, it's going to say, Holy Bible. <laughs> well, what's that mean? All right? And so if you've ever wondered that, I'm going to tell you. If you've never wondered that, I'm going to tell you anyway, okay? <laughs> and so, Bible. So the word Bible. Our English word Bible has its roots to a Greek word, Biblos, that, um, that really came from a Latin that had to go back so with ancient times. It means books, all right? Bible means books. And so this is, a, this is a book that is a collection of books. And we just talked about it. So we said, how many books are in the Bible? 66, we talked about that. And so um, it's very interesting where the word Bible came from. We won't talk about that so much tonight, but we also call it the Holy Bible. All right, now, the word holy is an interesting word. And so at the very root, the word holy, it, you know, it's this big, sanctified, sacred, spiritual-sounding word, and it is. But, but at the very root, the word holy means separated and different. Yeah, and that's really what holy is. It's something that is separated and different Something, you know, carries with the, the tones of, of being sacred. And so this is a holy book. All right? It's a different book. It's a sacred book for religious writings. And so um, what makes the Bible holy or makes it unique and different from all other books? And so the very name of it implies that it's a special unique book and this is to be revered all right now I, I happen to think you know that you know I, I treat my bible you know with respect but you know it's just a it, it's just a you know a book made with pages it has writing on it and you know the book itself isn't particularly that sacred a book in and of itself it's what the the story of the book in that tells us is really what makes it valuable all right but we still sort of have the respect so one of my favorite you know favorite one of my earliest memories so this we're going back a long time ago this, this could be going back i don't know but 60 years ago but it was a young teenage boy i think and but donnie and i were probably six 14 15 16 and i went with donnell to her great grandmother's house she's going to remember exactly what happened here and so i can still remember this and so uh, and they called her granny her Andy LaRue this is a great man I, she was probably 80 or 90 then and uh, we went to her house and um, and I don't know if I'd even met her before probably had I know right where it was at and so I remember just having a I don't know if I had a glass of iced tea but I had a drink and we sat down and I just set my drink down on the end table that was next uh, where I was sitting in that in the couch 
And, and, and Granny said, whoa, whoa, whoa. She, I tell her, I did something. I don't know if I upset her, but I, she, 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 learned, she was an old lady, but she, she moved with great speed and said, no, no, you can't do that. I had just placed my drink down on her Bible. <laughs> now, I don't need to say any more, do I? Don't need to say any more. Well, you know, I don't even play, I don't place book. I don't, you know, I don't use my Bible for a coaster. <laughs> but it, it somehow made this, this impression on me that this is such a sacred book for her. And I don't think you use your Bible for a doorstop either, you know, but, you know, but it's a, it's a book. It's not, but it's not, a, it's not just, it's this, but we don't worship this book, you know, uh, uh, but we treat it with respect because of, of what it contains in the message that it has. And that's what makes it possible. Okay, so now you know your Bible's divided up into two parts, right? So you have two testaments, okay? So you have a little pop quiz. You know the name of the testaments? I think they're on your page anyway, okay? Do you have the Old Testament and the New Testament, all right? You ever wonder why? No? Well, they're, they're really two different, you may say, big volumes of content, okay? And so the Old Testament, often it's called the Hebrew Bible or the Jewish Bible too. So if you have uh, Jewish friends, they have a Bible. It's the same Bible you have in your Old Testament. And so it's the Hebrew Jewish Bible. It was written over a period of time from the earliest, the oldest book is believed to be the book of Job. Probably written somewhere around 15, 1400 BC, okay? And over a period of a thousand years to about 400, 430 BC when the last prophet spoke. So over a period of about a thousand years, the Old Testament books, that's the books of history, the books of the law, this is the, you know, the poetry, the wisdom, the, the prophets, you know, it's a, the Psalms. This is it's a wonderful collection of, of Hebrew writing. It's written in Hebrew. We'll talk about that. So we have these 39 books, okay? But you also have a New Testament. Now, the reason you have a New Testament is because you are a Christian, right? And so this is a New Testament that was written by the disciples of Christ during the first century. So, it, so the New Testament was written probably around the earliest book, probably would be Galatians, we talked about it, maybe as early as 48 um, AD, but you could say really from about 48 to 50 to 95, the last book written would be Revelation probably written right near the end of the first century around 95 so basically a period there about 45 less than 50 years the new testament writings were written um, 27 of those all right that are recognized to be I, i'm going to say worthy of being in your bible but they uh, there's another word we're going to learn there it's called the canon and how they end up being in their canon why it's these 27 and so now that word testament, that word testament means covenant. And so it's an old covenant and new covenant. It's an idea of, a, of an agreement. And, you know, the covenant is a, is a concept that it's not, it's not biblical. It's biblical, but it didn't have its origins in the Bible. It's, it's more than biblical. Uh, so the covenant concept is, is ancient, used in all civilizations, also used in the scripture and God is a covenant making God and um, so just reminds you about a covenant and I just told this story I like telling this story so what a covenant does so you'll understand a covenant at the nature of it brings together two parties maybe it's two people or two nations whatever it is two entities that do not naturally have a, a relationship they bring them into a relationship okay? that's what a covenant does all right and so when Donnell and I got married, we were, we were bound together in a marriage covenant. And so because 
you know, she has a different set of parents. I have a different set of parents. We don't, we don't have a normal natural relationship outside the fact we love each other and want to be married, so we are in a covenant, okay? That's one, so, you know, you have the idea of a covenant. You know, Don and I, we live uh, out east of here, around Forest Ridge, and so we've been out there about 16, 17 years now. And so when, before we lived there, we lived over here in, uh, east here in Wolf Creek. Now, the reason I'm telling you that is we moved into Wolf Creek. It's a great neighborhood. We raised our kids there. It's a big neighborhood. I think there's over 800 people, houses in that neighborhood. And they had a homeowners association in Wolf Creek. It was pretty much voluntary, It's what I figured out, because the homeowner dues were $25 a year. And the president of the homeowners association lived next door to us, and he told us, that, you know, half the people don't even pay them. You don't even pay them, and it didn't, wasn't a big deal. And the other half of people aren't keeping, you know, they, so uh, you have a homeowner association. But Don and I moved out to Forest Ridge. I can never, I, you know, I remember this. I just say, we're getting ready to close on the house. And we get ready to close on the house. They take, a, they take a stack of paper, and I, this thick, and I'm not exaggerating, and they plop it down there, and they inform us, these are the homeowner's covenants. Wow, that's awesome. Homeowner covenants. And they tell you right away that your homeowner's dues will be uh, a few hundred, it was a few hundred, there's a lot more than $25. They're not very, you know, they're, they're several hundreds of dollars. And, and if you don't pay them, it's not voluntary. They'll put a lien on your house. And I remember looking at Don and said, these folks are serious. <laughs> and we won't last here six weeks. <laughs> We're still there. And the and, you know, homeowners association can be irritating. I've had people yell at me before. Uh, you know, I'm going to tell the homeowners association because you know I had something going on, and it's not a normal occurrence. I want you to know, but um, and you know, but uh, I think, God, people get a life. <laughs> but but I'm going to tell you something. I'm in covenant with all those hundreds of other people that live in our neighborhood, and I'm glad. I'm glad because I have to keep my home by certain regulations. They have to keep their home in agreement. That keeps all our property values up. Okay? And, they, and they mow the grass out there in the entrance most of the time. And they do stuff like that. So, I, I'm, you know, I'm not, but what that does is they call that a homeowner's, you have covenants. That's an agreement. I don't even, you know, I don't know these people. I don't, you know, most of them I don't know, but we're in a relationship because we live in the same subdivision. Well, that's a covenant. And so what you have here is you have a covenant. So you have the old covenant. Now, let me tell you what the old covenant is. It's, it's a, a covenant with God and his people. Now, who is his people? Well, you go all the way back to Abraham. God made a covenant. And so he brought him into relationship with Abraham. You go back to the Abrahamic covenant. And, and it's a one-sided covenant. I, can't, I don't want to get too sidetracked. But it's a one-sided covenant. This will help you and maybe understand a little bit. Even modern-day history and what's happening in the world. But God chose a people, and he chose a family, and he made the covenant with the father of that family, Abraham. And this is what he said, I'm going to keep my promise to you no matter what you do. It's a one-sided promise. And, only, and he made that, he cut a covenant, and that's in Genesis. And so that, this is... You know, they, this is why the Jews are God's chosen people. I'm going to but what God did is He made a covenant with the Jewish people. He made that at Mount Sinai. He gave them the law. That's the old covenant that would be fulfilled ultimately, not by the law, but there was Jeremiah even talked about the new covenant that was coming. And so there's the new covenant. So what's the new covenant? Well, the new covenant is the New Testament, which is the fulfillment of the Old Testament, where God now is drawing people from all nations to himself. And so you, you have the Jewish people in the Old Covenant that applies to all of God's people and then draw, draws himself fulfillment of the Old Testament. So you have these two covenants, the old and the fulfillment of the old in the new in Jesus Christ. And the church father, Tertullian, back I think 2nd or 3rd century AD, he, he's recognized as being the first one to use this word testament, sort of a differentiation between the Hebrew Bible and the, what we call the, 
the, the Christian New Testament Bible. Okay? All right. Now, if I told you to turn in your Bible to John 3.16, could you find it? Okay, great. Well, do you know why you can find it? Because somebody gave it an address, okay? Because uh, this you might not know, but these books of the Bible are divided into chapter and verse. And uh, that's so helpful, you know that? It's awesome. Because if you didn't have a chapter and you didn't have a verse, well, good luck trying to find something specific within the scriptures you're trying to locate. They're like addresses. And, you know, I think John 3.16, probably the best known of these addresses here. But I want you to know that the, the Bible wasn't written by chapter and verse. Okay? And so I want you to know that. Okay? So when it first was written, it was just written. And there were no really chapter divisions and there weren't any verses. And then as the Bible was being translated into different languages, and we've emphasized the English language, you know, these chapter and verse divisions came later. They were added centuries later, really just for the, if you said a convenience, but it's almost the necessity of being able to find a particular portion of Scripture, Okay. And so, um, Stephen Langton. I bet you haven't even thought about Stephen Langton in a long time. Well, you probably should, uh, you know, thank Stephen Langton. He was the Archbishop of Canterbury in the 13th century. He divided the Bible, and in, in really the New Testament, into chapters. All right, that's the entire Bible. I'm just you, he divided the entire Bible into chapters. The year was 1227, okay? And so it took him about a year, I think. So, you know, you went, you know, 12 centuries, uh, you know, uh, a millennium. Um, the Bible wasn't, you had those sister books, but you didn't have the chapters. It was a couple of 300 years, a couple of 300 years later, a fellow by the name of Robert Stephanus. He was a printer in Paris. And this is in the 16th century. He is credited for dividing the Bible into verses, okay? Now, a rabbi, a Jewish rabbi, um, had already begun dividing the Old Testament verses by verses. The chapters were kind of lined out. Langton had done that. They were kind of following that. And so he started in 1488, this Jewish rabbi, putting verses into the Old Testament and then Robert Stephanus came later and then added and finished it up, followed the Old Testament rabbi, and in the New Testament put the verses in. That was in 1551. That was a long time ago, but it wasn't all that long ago. You know, half a, you know, 500 years ago that it was divided into that. And, and, and what he did was he did the Greek and the Latin New Testament. It wasn't until the year 1560 that the very first English Bible was published that had chapter and verses identified in it. That's the Geneva Bible that came out. And so um, that's where they came from. So, you know, when you see those chapters and you see those verses, a couple of things you can remember. Those are artificial um, divisions that someone decided to put in. It's not a bad thing. You know, they're, they're, it's like a GPS to me. Just get me in the neighborhood, get me close, I can find what I'm looking for. So it just pinpoints a location for you. But they're, they're not inspired. They weren't put there by God. And, and sometimes, you know, preachers will say, like I say, you know, this is not really maybe this verse should go here. It's not a, the best place for a chapter division or a verse division. That's okay. Because it, it, that, this just came later. It's not really significant there. So this is an art, artificial you may say, loc locator that you find in your Bible. They were not part of when the, the, the original scriptures were written. So I'm going to tell you about this. So the original scriptures, okay, and we're going to talk a lot about this, but I'll give you a word if you don't know it. The original manuscript, so written, so you have the, the originals that were written. You will say the Apostle Paul 
you know, he's got a letter he's dictating and he's writing like Galatians, or you got, you got the prophet Isaiah, and you you got these whoever's writing. Those original writings, manuscripts, are called autographs. Okay. Autographs are the original writings. Now you know how many of those autographs you can go see today in the museum? Zero. Okay? None. There are no original manuscripts still in existence. Now I just want you to hold on to that. Don't let it freak you out for any reason. It shouldn't, but you should know it. All right? They don't exist. Why? Well, they written, you know, some of them were written, what's that, 2,500 years ago? Or even, you know, going back, they just, and they were written at a time when, you know, on certain materials. And that. So these autographs don't, they're not here. But what do we have? Well, we have copies. And so they were copied. And so you have these different manuscripts from the original that were coming. Okay, just know that. And so the chapter and verse, not part of the originals, the autographs became in very helpful. So here's some fun facts about the Bible. So you already know how many books are in the Bible? 66. Highway 66, you got it. Highway got it. How many chapters are in the Bible? Oh, 1,189 chapters are in the Bible. 1189. How many verses are in the Bible? Somebody's already ahead of me. 31,173, James. Are you checking? Yeah, I, have a, I love a fact checker, James. 31,173 verses in the Bible. How many words are in the King James Version, James? <laughs> 770,430. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I told you. I was a new King James. 783,137 words in the King James Version. That's a lot of words. You've got, um, you got 727,969 words in the NIV, which I use most of the time. And you've got 757,439 words in the English Standard Version. That's interesting. Why don't they all have the same number of words? Well, these are English Bibles, all right, being translated from the original language into English. That already gives you a little idea. When you translate from one language to another language, you've got to use... You might have to use a few more words, or you have to use some other words. I mean, so in, use different words, and that's what happens for that. And so we have these translations. So what is the Bible? I have myself about 10 minutes, and it's going to be just right. What is, let's see if I got this thing. Good. Okay, what is the Bible? First of all, don't hold on to that. I'm going to tell you that. There's a, there's a little children's song that probably every one of us learned if we'd been in church uh, as a kid. Jesus loves me. Okay. This I, how do you know it? The Bible tells me so. That's such a, that, that little kid's song is so important and really is at the very center of the truth. Jesus loves me. Okay, who's Jesus. Okay, and why does he love me? How do I know it? Well, the Bible tells me. Because if the Bible wasn't telling me that, I wouldn't know it. I wouldn't know it. And there you come to the significance of this. So in the essence, the Bible is, is a form of communication. It is how we know in the most important way that we know, but it's one of different ways, but it's the most important way that God talks to us is through his word. And this word has been recorded for us. And so God's word, so the Bible is God's personal message to you. Okay, right, so I'm, you need to write this down. I'm going to tell you, and, and, you're gonna, and, and don't forget it, and we're going to come back to it every week. The Bible was written... For you. It just wasn't written to you. Okay? And so you need to remember that. Because you need to remember who the Bible was written to to understand the message for you and the message that God has for you. And so the Bible is written for us 
Just remember, it wasn't written for us. Who was it written for? It was written for those people back in that day in which they, they, they lived, whether it was the prophet in the Old Testament warning of God's judgment that's coming, whether it was Paul warning the Galatians, you know, you put upon these false teachers. So it's written to them, but the message is still for us. Now, this is important because this, is, this tells us something about God. God wants to be known. He is a God who longs to be known, wants to be known by us. And so he is a communicating God. He communicates to us. He makes himself known. And so the Bible is a revelation from God. So here's, a big, here's the first big important word to, to get. The Bible is a revelation. All right, Not the last book of the Bible. That's called Revelation. But this is the whole Bible is in a sense a revelation because this is how God speaks his heart and his mind to our heart and minds. He reveals himself. He makes himself known. And so revelation, it's the doctrine of revelation, understanding it, is sort of this disclosure and this unveiling. It's a making known. And so God's making himself known. And so two ways, primary ways that God has revealed himself. God has revealed himself through his world and through his word. Okay? You might say through his creation and through his spoken word. These two primary ways that he speaks to us. And so when he speaks to us through his creation and through the world, that's called general revelation, okay? And so, it's, so you need to know what, what general revelation is. And so general revelation, Revelation deals with general truths. Okay, so these are broad, you might say universal truths that can be known about God through his creation and through nature. It's the natural revelation, you may say. And so really the several verses and all through the Bible, one of the, the strongest that speaks is Psalm 19, beginning of verse 1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God. Okay. We're talking about the heaven. Well, you know, let's look at the creation, the sky. There's something about just the majesty and the magnificence and the, just the expanse of heaven. They declare the glory of God. The sky proclaims the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. The fact there's a day and a night tells us something about order, and there's a creation order, and there seems to be something, if there's creation order, there's something behind that creation they have speech. Creation speaks. They speak without words, though. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes forth out into all the world, their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. So I said, this is general revelation that basically speaks about a God who is, exists, a God who is powerful, it tells us about, you can observe his, really his intellect, his order, the, the, the wonder of it, the power of it. It tells us there, there is a God. Okay? There's a creator that exists. And so when Paul gets to writing the Romans in chapter 1, he says, for since the creation of the world, okay, from the beginning of time, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power his divine nature have been clearly seen you see it it's there being understood from what has been made creation so that people are without excuse so if anyone says I don't believe in God there can't be a God they're without excuse. I mean, that's just a, you know, just look. Hey, there is a God. Now, if you choose not to believe in that God, then okay. But this, that's called general revelation. It's a revelation of God to all people at all times and all places that proves there is a God that exists, that he is intelligent, that he is powerful, and that he is a totally other transcendent God. There is someone other than me. 
That's general revelation. You see it in creation and creation order. That's all you know. Don't know his name. Don't know what he expects from me. I don't know really how to relate to him. But I, I know there's a God. That's what we see through the general revelation of God. And he uses that maybe in the beginning place to bring people to, to a knowledge of him. That's general natural revelation. Now there is special revelation. The special revelation, that's supernatural. Now that's specific revelation. And Hebrews 4.12, see this way you need your Bible. I got the verses for you here though. For the word of God is alive and active, okay? So this is not like any other book. This is a book that is alive with the Spirit of God. It's active. It's working. It's sharper than a double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing the soul and the spirit, the joints and the marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. And so now we know this, there's something about this book that's different. And this is where God is supernaturally making himself known. And there's a whole process that we're going to talk about. He does that, but he begins this with this special revelation where God miraculously guides human I call them human authors and in one sense they're authors but they're, they're, they're authors in the sense they are they're, they're scribes but they're more than scribes we'll talk about that next week they're not they're not dict, you know they're just not writing word for word it's the inspiration process but he's guiding them human authors involved in the process to correctly record his message to people because he wants us to know accurately and truthfully who he is, what he wants, and how we're to know him. And he tells us that. And so, you know, Jesus loves me. I know who Jesus is. How do I know? The Bible tells me so. That's how I know. And, and the Bible records where it's who it is and why he loves me. This is a process of inspiration. So the primary verse on inspiration is 2 Timothy 3.16. You can see it there. It said, all scripture... Now, if you're in your Bible, you can be, is the word, it can be, it, literally the word is God breathed, but the word's translated ins, inspired. Okay, we're talking about inspiration. Okay, but that is inspiration. It's the process of God breathing his word. So all scriptures God breathed, it's inspired, it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Let's go, God determined. And to have the truth regarding him written down. And so in that process of revealing himself, what he wants known about himself, he wants it recorded in written form. And so he decided to, to have everything that we need to know about him, what he expects, what he wants done for us to be revealed, supernaturally written for us in the Bible. And it's a process where he, he brings about 40 different people in the process of over 14, 1500 years of writing this Bible. Second Peter 1, 20, 21 says, Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture, meaning the Word of God, came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. You know, so it's not like they, they just thought this up. Verse 21, For the for prophecy never had its origin in human will. But prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. That's the miraculous process of inspiration. God carrying them along by the Holy Spirit. It is God breathed. And so that's the doctrine of inspiration that we'll talk about next week. So God chose to reveal himself in a written book. God wrote a book. He's the author of the book. He allowed other humans to come and be part of that writing process. But it is above, it, it is alone, it alone is the revelation that's given to us of God's mind to our mind and how he conveys his truth to us. And so this is how we meet God in the Bible. Okay, I'm going to tell you, this is why God gave us the Bible because the God... God reveals our need. The Bible reveals our need for God to us. I'll just close with this, okay? The Bible reveals our need for God. And, um, you know, when we read the Bible, 
study the Bible, we just come face to face very quickly with the sin problem. And we want to understand what's wrong with us, what's wrong with this world in which we live in. And so the Bible tells us that we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. It tells us where, the, where it all went wrong in Genesis 3. It talks about the wages of sin is death. It talks about all that is there in the future who reject Christ. So all that's laid out for us in the Scripture, it, you know, it reveals our, the Bible reveals our need for God, but it also reveals God's answer to our need. And so once God has shown us our problem, sin, separation, he reveals that Jesus, his son, who he is, how he was born, he's the solution. And that's why we know that Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary. We know why he was born, what he came to do. He ultimately was our sacrifice for us. He took our place, became one of us, fully human and fully divine. It's revealed to us. And so the Bible really is, is all about Jesus. Ultimately, it always is pointing towards him. And it's always bringing that message. And it was written for us. It was written to make himself known to us. And so I'll just close with this. You know, you get down to the end of the book of John. And so, you know, the book of John is written around seven miracles, okay? And so that kind of makes the outline of John. And so when John gets near the end of his book, he gets right down to the end of chapter 20. This is what John says. is Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which means John did these seven miracles that I wrote about, but he did a whole lot of other miracles too that aren't in this gospel that I wrote to you. But John goes on to say, but these were written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That's true for the Gospel of John and those seven miracles. That's true for the whole Bible. That's all we have this Bible. You know, I think it was John that said he, earlier, he said, I don't think the whole world can contain all the books that were written about Jesus. Everything he did was written down. Certain things were written down. These things were written down. And these things were written down. Let us know this is sufficient enough for us. So the purpose of the Bible is not to inform us. Well, I skipped a lot of supplies here, didn't I? Look at that. Purpose of the Bible is not to inform us, even though it does. But that's not its primary purpose. Its primary purpose is to transform us because it, can, it contains the message then that it is a transforming power of the Holy Spirit. It impacts our life and changes our life for eternity. And then... This faith comes Okay, it's good enough. We're so close to the end. <laughs> faith comes from hearing the message. So this is the message that comes and from hearing it, reading the message is heard through the word of Christ. And so it's the Bible. And so that's your Bible that you have there. I hope you, you have your Bible, you read your Bible, you treasure your Bible. And uh, next week we're going to talk about how we can know this Bible really is God's Word and what that means to say, is it God's Word? Does it contain God's Word? What does it make any difference? All right? Let me pray for you, okay? Father, we thank you for the time tonight just to be reminded and to, and to learn more about the story of, of your Word that contains the story that changes all of our lives through Jesus Christ, that you love us and you gave your life for us. And we know that because the Bible tells us so. So thank you for every person that's here tonight. I pray you'll work in their lives, meet every need. Thank you for loving us and changing us through the power of your word. In Jesus Christ we pray, amen. Amen, amen. God bless you and see you Sunday. All right.